Well, welcome to the theoretical astrophysics program seminar series, where uh, we continue this year with uh, a uh, friend of LPL, a uh, graduate student of LPL who graduated in 2020, is Severio Cambioni. Uh, Severio uh, was originally a uh, space systems engineer as an undergraduate and a master's student at uh, Sapienza in Rome, got his uh, master's there in 2016, his undergraduate there the year before, uh, came to LPL to work on problems of planetary science, first with Renu Malhotra and then with myself and with uh, Roberto Ferfaro also, and uh, um, brought me into the fold of machine learning where I had, um, you know, much about it as you do by reading things on the internet, to Scientific American, things like that. I'm a math major, so I was always intrigued by this process. And uh, he obtained uh, this uh, research direction for my group, which was to go after the somewhat low hanging fruit in machine learning applied to large uh, computational databases, simulation physics, and trying to develop surrogate models. And so that was his impact with my group in LPL, but he also worked with uh, Jack Holt's group doing some radar uh, uh, analysis of uh, radar data for Lake uh, Vostok. Um, and then the work he had done with uh, Malhotra uh, led to a publication on uh, the symmetry plane of the main asteroid belt. So pretty diverse uh, set of research. And then went on to Caltech for a postdoc with Catherine DeClear, uh, where uh, uh, so I'm on the psyche team and kind of to my surprise, you know, suddenly comes this amazing, these amazing ground-based uh, 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 results uh, uh, of, of psyche and uh, has given us some of our best ground truth. And then uh, on the OSIRIS-REx team, he, as an undergraduate, I mean, as a graduate student researcher on the, on the OSIRIS-REx mission, and then later as a graduate, as a postgraduate, uh, worked on thermal modeling and understanding of uh, evolution of rocks and boulders on the surface that led to a first author nature letter. It's uh, quite impressive. So uh, now he's at MIT working with Ben Weiss as the uh, 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 distinguished uh, uh, postgraduate fellow. And uh, he's here to talk to us today about collisional formation and evolution of metal rich planetary bodies. So very good. Thank you very much. It's very nice uh, uh, introduction. And thank you everybody for coming. Person and online. Uh, it's very nice to be here and see a lot of uh, familiar uh, faces. Uh, so I'm very uh, excited to talk about uh, my uh, research on the collisional uh, uh, formation and evolution of metal rich uh, uh, planetary bodies. I'm going to present uh, like both numerical uh, uh, results today, but also astronomical ob observations to uh, try to uh, understand how this very interesting uh, world form. To start, uh, I would like to uh, introduce what a metal ring is. And uh, uh, what you see here uh, is a, a probability density function of the iron to magnesium weight ratio of uh, uh, stars in the um, galactic neighborhood of uh, the sun that they have planets. So, a, a first uh, uh, approximation, say at zero, the approximation. Planets that form from the protoplanetary disks of these stars would have a, a, an abundance of, uh, of uh, rock forming elements as they rock stars. And uh, uh, indeed, if we plot uh, the iron to magnesium weight ratio of Earth on this plot, the peaks uh, is around like the value of the uh, peak. So Earth uh, has uh, like a, a core, a metal core, which uh, takes uh, about, about half of the size of the uh, planet. However, uh, not all planets are uh, in uh, this way. Uh, notoriously, uh, the messenger data uh, revealed that the planet Mercury has an uh, estimated iron to magnesium weight ratio that uh, peaks uh, that goes all the way on the right of the chart. So if we assume uh, this is a Gaussian, that would be more than a five sigma uh, away from the average. So uh, the planet Mercury has a core that is about 70% uh, of its uh, and uh, uh, kind of challenges our understanding of uh, uh, planet uh, uh, formation. This is a long-standing uh, uh, problem. It's well known, but uh, um, recently the enigma got even uh, deeper uh, because uh, planet Mercury, let's say, 
we live in this exciting time in which we can detect exoplanets around the nearby stars. And some of these exoplanets, uh, um, from their mass and uh, radius, their density uh, is uh, uh, quite higher than what, what one would expect to scaling up uh, Earth. Uh, one example is uh, uh, K2229b that uh, has an interior structure which is uh, uh, similar uh, to uh, Mercury, so also 70% of the mass is uh, uh, in the uh, core. And then uh, if we go as smaller uh, bodies, uh, in particular, uh, like M-type asteroids, traditionally thought to be the uh, parent body of iron uh, uh, meteorites. Uh, also here, like the metal content uh, varies between these bodies. But for example, uh, for the largest asteroid of this class, asteroid Psyche, as, as Eric mentioned, will be explored by uh, a mission in 2023. Based on its density, uh, the volume of metal goes between, let's say, 50%. So uh, how this uh, family of objects that uh, encompass all masses from asteroids to super Earth form is uh, remain uh, unknown. And uh, uh, this indeed is uh, the first uh, element of re relevance uh, of this uh, research to planetary science. Uh, one thing that I will present uh, on today uh, is that uh, we can, uh, these, pop these uh, objects could form being, let's say, ordinary objects with uh, a formless fraction <coughs> like that of and they have collisions that remove the uh, outer uh, material, the uh, mantle, uh, leaving behind the core of uh, a differentiated planet. Uh, the uh, importance of study matter rich uh, uh, bodies, uh, however, is also related to uh, early habitability. Uh, if uh, a matter rich object would have impacted the early Earth, the large availability of uh, uh, metal would have reacted with, would have created a lot of chemical reaction with the early water, probably uh, creating a prebiotic uh, uh, re chemical reduced condition that could have led to prebiotic uh, uh, chemistry. From the side of metal rich asteroids, the uh, fact that uh, uh, there is a high metal content that could lead to very exotic uh, geophysics on the surface of this body. One could envision that uh, metal blocks can break in a brittle way. Uh, during the day, and then as the asteroid rotate during the night, uh, sorry, ductly during the day, and then as the asteroid rotate in the night, it gets cold and it, it may break briefly. And finally, if we uh, have to deflect an asteroid that is on collision course uh, with Earth, we would like to know if its composition is uh, uh, metallic or not. Here, you may be familiar with now with this image from the laser cube. Uh, 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 CubeSat uh, of the DART uh, uh, impact. I just want to take a moment to uh, like stress how amazing a, a complex this structure uh, is uh, for uh, uh, the impact. And therefore, like this could change as a function of composition. So today I'm going to talk about the metal rich uh, uh, worlds. How do they form? How do they evolve? And how we can explore and characterize them. And uh, I would like to test an hypothesis uh, that is, uh, uh, metal rich worlds uh, are remnants uh, of uh, uh, giant impacts. Uh, so, a larger collisions that are thought to uh, be common uh, during the last stage of uh, uh, planet formation. There are other hypotheses. One, one other hypothesis, for example, is that these objects are remnant of uh, um, accretion of uh, uh, primordial metal rich materials. And uh, for example, if that would, would be true, like then it is very interesting to understand how you can ac uh, accumulate <clears throat> so much like uh, metal rich material uh, to form, for instance, a metallic uh, super Earth. But holding on this uh, uh, testable hypothesis, I, um, I will test this running two uh, activities. The first one is numerical uh, modeling of uh, uh, this process of giant impacts which comes from the uh, work of my thesis uh, continued during my postdoc work. And the second is astronomical observation of metal rich uh, worlds, uh, in, particular with, in particular with ARC. I would like to spend a, a moment uh, introducing the geometry of uh, uh, giant impacts and uh, uh, the event of giant impacts. So the, the idea is that there, is, there are two bodies that are similar in size. And here I'm assuming that they are differentiated in a core and a mantle. 
So the smaller one is called projectile and the larger one is called target. Um, the mass uh, will be indicated with M and zeta. And the impact outcome will be how the masses of the two objects and their composition in terms of core mass fraction change, but also how uh, the orbit after the collision change uh, 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 as well. And uh, the input of this process are not only the masses and the composition, but also the velocity of the collision and uh, uh, the angle of, uh, um, of collision. So the impact angle that affect, uh, as I'm gonna show in a moment. The, uh, the outcome of collisions. So these uh, uh, inputs uh, are uh, important because uh, they make the process of uh, um, giant impacts intrinsically three-dimensional. This was uh, a project that I did was when I was a graduate student here, um, funded by the Graduate Professional Student Council. Uh, we um, rendered in virtual reality a uh, uh, giant impact simulation so that uh, with bubbles we could like enter and see like the um, intrinsically three dimensionality of this uh, process. And I think uh, this uh, equipment is still upstairs yes. in, the, in your lab, I think, if anyone uh, wants to, uh, to look at it. But flattened uh, on a uh, 2D uh, plane uh, in terms of parameter space, keeping the mass, for example, of the target and project type uh, constant, uh, in a plane of impact velocity on the uh, y axis and impact angle on x axis. I'm going to show that uh, uh, there is a large diversity of uh, uh, outcomes. And uh, the question is, is if, uh, whether this large diversity of outcomes translate uh, in something in diversity of composition as observed among the planets. One example, uh, for example, is when we have uh, like a low impact angle and low impact velocity. The uh, result of the, um, the collision <laughs> here simulated in the work by, uh, Alex, uh, by Andreas Rapper and Eric um, and uh, refer 2014, uh, is indeed uh, a, a merging event. So like uh, the two bodies merge together. But uh, if we increase the uh, velocity of the collision, the result is uh, a erosion of the mantle of the target. So this is a first venue, for example, to make uh, metal-rich uh, bodies. But then the question it becomes whether these debris will indeed leave the system or come back to be accreted. This is like notoriously one of the challenges for the formation of mercury in a giant impact as with mercury as the target. If the velocity is kept low at about the neutral escape velocity of the system, but we increase the impact angle, this brings a lot of angular momentum into the system and uh, uh, the result is a grazing merge. So the projectile core merge into the target, but uh, it liberates a lot of debris that, uh, um, for example, like is the, uh, from which the moon would, could have formed. So this is the base of the canonical uh, model of moon formation. And uh, uh, crucially for uh, this uh, uh, talk, uh, the process of hit and run arises when uh, um, high velocity, we have high velocity, high impact time. Hit and run uh, is uh, um, a procedure that was explored uh, early on in, the, in, by, in a paper by Eric, in which uh, the um, uh, projectile grazes the uh, target, but has enough uh, kinetic energy to escape the uh, collision. In this process, the target uh, accretes the mantle of the projectile so that the projectile escapes with uh, a higher metal content. So we have hit and run and uh, um, erosive uh, disruptive uh, uh, conditions. So the, the question is, can uh, some of these two may or both make uh, uh, metal rich bodies? And I wanted to stress, however, that not all the uh, parameter space that I show is equally probable. Uh, the reason being that the velocity is typically controlled by a uh, oh, question. Can you say something about what went into the simulations? How were the planets modeled? Yes, sure. So these uh, uh, simulations are uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. Thank you for bringing it up. I should have mentioned about uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, uh, they assume that the bodies are fully fluid, and uh, uh, they uh, so the um, equation of Navier Stokes equation, equation and they also take into account the process of shock physics by introducing uh, artificial viscosity, so uh, like widening the shocks uh, in a way that makes it numerically. Uh, risk um, and um, yeah, so this is, and then it uses algorithm to track the evolution of the particles, smoothing uh, 
uh, across the several different particles. Yeah. yeah, thank you for your question. So the point I was I'm trying to make with this slide uh, is that uh, uh, in the same impact uh, uh, ang impact velocity and impact angle plane, depending on where we are, for example, uh, uh, away from uh, the uh, star, um, different velocity may be uh, accessible. Uh, here, for example, is the case in which uh, a probability density function of velocity uh, it, it remains quite high, even uh, high uh, um, multiples of the escape velocity. But uh, uh, for example, away from the star, uh, only like a low uh, impact angle, uh, impact velocity collision uh, are uh, probable to occur, higher than a few percent. So to probe all this diversity of outcome and to uh, understand and parse what is probable from what is possible from what is probable, uh, we need to run a lot of simulations. And uh, the physics that I mentioned uh, of the smoother particle hydrodynamics uh, requires a, a lengthy simulation so in order of uh, uh, hours, if not days. Uh, in this, indeed, like my uh, research on uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, made uh, like an advancement in how we can bring uh, these uh, uh, simulations into uh, planet formation theories. The idea is that instead of using directly the uh, numerical simulation, one can take examples from this numerical simulation in the form of inputs and outputs and uh, uh, feed them to a, a neural network or a machine learning network more general terms. So what the hope is that this algorithm gives a prediction that is uh, uh, as, as close as possible to the one of the uh, simulation. So the algorithm is mimicking the uh, prediction, but uh, in a very short runtime. So that every time there is a, a collision in a, a planet formation star, instead of uh, stopping the code and going to run the uh, simulation, we can use this and get a, 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 an answer within a non-level. To open a bit the black box of how this works, I want to just spend a, a few seconds to say how like a, a basic machine learning algorithm works. So the very uh, basic uh, unit of, for instance, a neural network is a neuron that taking, uh, uh, for example, these four inputs of the collision, uh, multiplies these by uh, numbers that are called uh, weights, which is uh, what will be learned uh, then in the process of machine learning, combines it uh, in a sum and uh, uses a nonlinear function to make a prediction. And then they hope uh, for this prediction is that uh, it captured the masses and the composition of the two largest remnants at least and their form. However, this type of algorithm is of course too simple because it's a parametric function that we can write down the, the equation, but uh, it will not capture all the complexity. However, uh, something better can be done by putting together multiple uh, of these neurons in what is called a neural network. In this case, we uh, take like the data set, the parse the input and output of the collision, with input are the masses, the velocity, the impact angle, and the output are the masses, composition, and orbits of the remnants. The inputs are passed the, to uh, the network that based on the, on the, in the weights will make a prediction. This prediction is compared to uh, known outcomes and uh, the uh, mismatch, the error is uh, fed back into uh, the uh, network. This process uh, allows uh, to uh, tune these weights until uh, like the prediction gets below the error between prediction and target value gets below the numerical error of the uh, uh, SPH of the smooth partial hydrodynamic simulation. So in this way, this algorithm can then be used to substitute the, uh, the code and make like a faster, uh, but still accurate prediction. This process is similar to uh, fitting a function to data with the advantage that uh, um, there are techniques that uh, avoid to overfit uh, the uh, data. What uh, uh, we did with uh, our postdoc here at LPL, Alexander Hansen Huber, was then to code this neural network into a, a routine that can be uh, used within uh, uh, the planning formation studies and it's publicly available on uh, uh, GitHub. And uh, this allows to bring uh, the realism of uh, uh, giant impacts into planet formation studies. 
And this, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really, uh, I think, important because typically in studies just assume that planets uh, simply merge. So there is not a, a way to increase the composition and diversity and therefore uh, follow like the evolution of metal rich worlds. Hi, Saverio, can I ask a quick question? Hey, hi, yes. Okay, this, this is Renu Malhotra, hi. Um, uh, I was wondering, is one of the inputs or outputs this ratio of um, iron to magnesium that you started with at the beginning, uh, which was, um, which of course is somewhat nuanced um, in these uh, hydrodynamic simulations. How do you put that in as an, as an input or output? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's both tracked as an input and an output. It's parameterized in terms of uh, uh, the core mass fraction. Uh, so how much uh, of the mass of the, of the planet is within the uh, metal core. And assuming that the, uh, I mean, with the assumption that uh, magnesium is tracking the, um, co the composition of the metal material. So the, this uh, uh, core mass fraction is an input of the, uh, because it's the one of the target and project type. And then uh, like uh, uh, the model is able also to uh, make a prediction for how this evolve uh, uh, through the uh, collision. And so if you end up having like a larger core mass fraction that what you uh, started. So that's the way in which it's parameterized. So I don't quite see that because that's what you're talking about is basically a metal fraction rather than um, iron to magnesium. So am I missing something? I'm making an assumption that's, that's correct. and. Uh, I'm assuming that like the uh, bulk of the iron is in the core of the planet uh, and the uh, magnesium uh, like is uh, uh, tracking, uh, let's say like uh, the, uh, the mass, uh, uh, the, comp the contribution of the mass uh, uh, of the mantle to the total uh, uh, mass. This uh, of course is an, is an approximation because of, like uh, elements partition between the mantle and the, uh, and the core. Like so now all the iron, for example, will be uh, in the, the uh, in the in the core, for example, but that like uh, it's um, it's tracking the uh, let's say like the bulk composition, the bulk metal content of the plant. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a basic question. Yeah. Please. So, why does the metallicity? Why does the metal content change when two planets collide? Is it because of mixing of material or is there any other process that takes yeah, place? Thank you for your question. So uh, one, uh, one way, so when you have a collision, the first materials that are eroded are those from the mantle that they tend, tend to, they are silicate uh, uh, rich. So these are like are eroded the first uh, and then like uh, the metal content in that case, like uh, will, uh, the, the, the core mass fraction will increase uh, because you, uh, and yeah, thank you for your question. I think I have one last one, sorry. Yeah, if we can go back to your neural network, uh, how much data do you need for the known outcome that you use for the neural network to be tested? So how much data do you take from the literature to develop the network? That's a great question. So uh, the data that like one needs like a camera uh, trial uh, and an error uh, if you start uh, importantly, you need to uh, divide this data set uh, in uh, uh, to at least two parts. So the first one, the, the bulk of the data we use is for training, and then some of these will be only used to assess the capability of the networks in the end. So that, that's called uh, uh, test. In this case, we used uh, about 800 simulations. There you go. <laughs> I actually like it. Uh, yeah. uh, so you you mentioned that um, this can be akin to you know fitting a function to the data set, but that you are able to avoid some of the issues with that, or or you know simply interpolating between results. Can you expand a bit on that? Yeah. So uh, interpolation by definition is uh, like uh, uh, overfitting the data because uh, you you are like passing a function and like a, a straight all through the data. It's a uh, mm, like piecewise function. Um, you may fit uh, like a function uh, to, to the data that like, uh, uh, but then uh, like if you choose for, its, for example, a power law, you will not know if that like uh, uh, is the uh, type of function among all the functions you could choose that uh, uh, least overfit the data. 
So part uh, of the training set that I mentioned, uh, second ago, goes uh, to do this validation process. So look <coughs> for all the possible type of neural networks changing the different, uh, like, uh, um, for example, uh, activation function, which is a uh, linear curve, the number of neurons, um, which one is the best to, uh, in the sense that least overfit the data. So it's uh, like a bit more like, a, it's of course more powerful than interpolation and more robust of like simply choosing a lock at a certain function. But then like the, the draw cycle is that it doesn't give you immediately a physical understanding of why that type of function was the best like to, to the, at the least overfit the data. Yeah. Awesome. And that, so here, uh, just like to to move like to one of the results that we did uh, that we produced using the uh, this neural network. And what uh, this was a, a study led by Alexander and Sir Huber, um, in which uh, we uh, run uh, um, rerun uh, simulations that were published uh, of uh, evolution in a environment of planetary uh, embryos. And uh, we assume that two, uh, we run two types of simulation with the same initial condition. One, uh, I just assume the perfect <laughs> merging, meaning that when two planets collide, they simply merge. And remember that merging is, is only one small part of the parameter space of possible collision. And the other one is that they use the, the uh, machine learning algorithm. This uh, is probably the most iconic plot uh, uh, from this uh, work is the mass uh, of uh, the, uh, that is in the embryos as a function of time. And uh, uh, there are two curves. This uh, uh, upper curve is the result uh, in perfect from perfect merging simulation, in which uh, mass is lost a bit by ejection from the system or uh, by uh, the planet falling into the star, but not by production of debris. In this other case, instead, there is this catastrophic mass loss from the debris which uh, debris uh, uh, that has more than the second remnants of the escaping projectile in hit the run collision are not uh, uh, like uh, accreted, so they attract their mass, but they don't interact with the embryos. So you have this, the most of the mass basically goes into the debris. So uh, one may expect that the reality uh, of the uh, giant impact process uh, and, and formation will lie somewhere in between uh, these uh, two uh, curves because these are like a track when uh, uh, mass is not lost and this mass is uh, from is lost into the breeze, but uh, uh, not really accreted. Relevant to the question of, yes. Does not really accreted mean just during that one impact event or over some long planet formation time scale? It, it, it doesn't interact with the embryos uh, like at all uh, uh, during the entire process. It's a, it's a big assumption. And indeed the, like, uh, uh, like how that like, uh, would uh, uh, interact uh, is a part of the current research that uh, we are doing right now. Coming back to the question of uh, the uh, meta rich words, though, uh, like uh, uh, I post processed the these results uh, uh, in this paper in 2021 to see uh, which uh, planet uh, uh, using uh, both uh, like the perfect merging approach and the uh, machine learning approach. Uh, could be uh, what was forming to be metal uh, uh, rich, so with uh, a high uh, core mass fraction. Here is a, a plot of core mass fraction as a function of mass and uh, unit of earth masses. Uh, the solar system has this peculiar thing that uh, uh, the, if we plot the core mass fraction of the planets, uh, is, they fall in, in a sort of this uh, uh, V shape uh, uh, structure. We know uh, the core mass fraction of Mercury from messenger data. Mars should plot a bit higher this, uh, because now with the tight data. We know that of Earth for, uh, uh, with seismology, but uh, uh, Venus uh, is just based on the density uh, and, uh, and moment of inertia looking forward to the find out. But uh, uh, if we, I plot here the result uh, of perfect merging, the planets start with uh, the composition of uh, Earth. And uh, because they just sum, like uh, in large, being becoming larger and larger, this doesn't promote any compositional diversity. So they, uh, the compositional diversity basically stays close to uh, to what started. And if you see some of uh, uh, like uh, uh, variance here, is because this uh, um, uh, uh, paper also took into account the process of planetary differentiation, so partitioning of uh, iron, for example, between the core and the mantle. 
But uh, if I said I plot the results from, uh, uh, machine, uh, from the machine learning approach, not only there are more uh, uh, planets, and so these are all planets from whole simulations combined at the end of uh, uh, formation. There are uh, also small uh, uh, planets, uh, both the Mars size and Mercury size, that uh, are still present at the end of the uh, evolution. But uh, the, um, um, the profile of the core mass fraction, the spread of core mass fraction as a function of mass, qualitatively uh, resemble this sort of the shape of the terrestrial planet. Interestingly, uh, the, um, uh, the number of heat and run collisions that, as we saw, can increase the metal content of a body uh, increases as the number, as the, uh, the mass of the, pro of the bodies decreases. There are some outliers here that are uh, direct erosions, so like in which uh, uh, the target is. Uh, so uh, I interpreted this plot to mean that uh, <clears throat> the larger planets never had anything bigger than themselves to impact into. And so they never served as a hit and run projectiles for a uh, 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 <clears throat> Instead, uh, the uh, smaller bodies uh, experience a multiple hit and run, some of which uh, um, like, uh, started in the outer solar system and had uh, like a low uh, core mass fraction to start to be, but some of them uh, got to have a very high core mass fraction at the end of uh, uh, formation. And uh, if one extrapolates this trend, then one thing that we could expect is that uh, among the population of asteroids, there should be some uh, metal rich. Uh, uh, worlds. And this brings me to the second part uh, of uh, uh, the talk, which is uh, the astronomical observation of some of these metal rich uh, uh, asteroids. And in particular, I focused uh, uh, in uh, my postdoctoral research on asteroid 16 uh, uh, Psyche, which is the target of a forthcoming mission that will establish where the is uh, uh, the core of a differentiated uh, planetesimal. So the, the fiducial model for the formation of Psyche is that uh, the, uh, the, the Psyche was a differentiated planetesimal, that uh, at a certain point, uh, a collision happened. And uh, it, it's not clear if it, uh, the Psyche is the target or the uh, projectile of the collision. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, collision removed the mental material from the one of the two bodies. And what is left is uh, uh, at the core of uh, uh, one of uh, these bodies with some vestige of the mantle around that. So if uh, this is true, uh, by uh, looking at the surface of uh, Psyche, one uh, uh, may expect to uh, see a landscape like this. So in which uh, there is a thin, uh, a thin mantle that remain. Uh, and uh, in some places, uh, subsequent impact could have excavated uh, the uh, crust to uh, like reveal metal uh, deposit, metal or directly uh, the core. Uh, the thin crust that could have promoted the exotic type of volcanism, like the kind of volcanism that was proposed uh, in uh, recently in two uh, separate papers. In uh, these papers, proposed that in, under some circumstances, uh, for example, uh, the presence of volatile materials, uh, the uh, fellow uh, the material uh, at the outer core could erupt on the, uh, the uh, surface. And then in some areas uh, might have uh, like a remnant uh, uh, mantle. So the testable, uh, testable hypothesis observation or prediction here is that the composition of psychic surface should vary between being uh, uh, in some areas uh, metal rich and in some areas uh, uh, silicate rich, if this is the core of a differentiated. To test uh, this, uh, um, I, we, I, uh, I collaborated with uh, uh, Catherine Declare at Caltech and Mike Sheffer from Brunswick University to uh, look at the surface of Psyche in thermal emission. The reason why uh, observation in thermal emission are powerful is because we can constrain the emissivity of the uh, surface. This uh, uh, is a function of uh, the uh, metal content of the surface through a quantity uh, that is the dielectric constant. So the dielectric constant is uh, the polarizability of a material. So when it's applied an electric field, how easy is to displace the, the charges in the material. So metals have a very high, tend to be a very high dielectric uh, uh, constant. And because the dielectric constant uh, to the Maxwell equations is connected uh, uh, to uh, the index of refraction, 
then uh, it controls the reflectivity and therefore the, the uh, emissivity. So here uh, is a, a simple case of a mixture between uh, mafic rocks and uh, uh, methyl uh, oxide and sulfides, which are the two N members, and uh, mapping how the emissivity varies as a function of the electric constant. So the, the emissivity is a, a monotonically decreasing function of this. So if we are able to map uh, uh, the electric constant over the surface of a psyche, we may have information about uh, uh, the of metal deposits and silicate rich deposits. However, we need also to resolve, uh, especially the surface of site. Because if, for example, we use an infrared telescope, which is typically used to make measurements of thermal emission, no infrared telescope, no even a 10 meter infrared telescope uh, would be able to uh, spatially resolve uh, the surface of Psyche. Uh, for, uh, this uh, comes from uh, like the fundamental equation of a telescope uh, where a lambda is the wavelength and D is the uh, diameter. So that's why we use the, uh, a radio telescope and a very special one, which is ALMA, which is indeed like uh, uh, able to uh, produce a signal equivalent to a, a telescope of a diameter of 15 kilometers. And this gave a special resolution of psyche of 30 kilometers. So these are uh, the uh, data that uh, were collected by Catherine de Clare, uh, like uh, using ALMA. What you're seeing here is uh, a psyche in thermal emission. Uh, in fact, this uh, is a unit of brightness temperature, which is what you get by inverting the Planck function. And uh, um, ALMA is able to do uh, this uh, and to take these images because it's an array of uh, uh, 66 antennas that uh, uh, look at the units on the same uh, source, but because they receive the signal at slightly different times, we can, they, this signal can be correlated and uh, uh, mimicking uh, uh, a telescope that has a diameter of uh, uh, 15 kilometers. What, uh, 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 one thing that we can do is to project this data, which is easier to see in this Mulvaid map. The west is on the, uh, here on the left and the east is on the right. Still a, a time average brightness temperature. So for each point on the surface, uh, uh, taking the average uh, during the day. Some areas that could not be seen during uh, uh, the observation, and this area that is uh, etched could have artifacts due to observational very high emission angle. So I want to stress that this is one of the uh, first uh, um, thermal mapping uh, of an asteroid from Earth. Usually, what we see is just uh, like one uh, uh, pixel of uh, in the infrared. My contribution to this has been to uh, fit a thermophysical model. Uh, which uh, takes the electric constant and also thermal inertia, so how fast the temperature change during, uh, uh, during the day. Uh, plugging in into uh, a well-established thermophysical model that uh, solve the thermophysical equation within the subsurface, so the thermal conduction, um, giving then the, surf the temperature at the surface and within the subsurface. And I want to stress that most models will stop here because you, you don't need more to interpret uh, infrared thermal emission. However, uh, in this case, uh, uh, a simulator of the thermal images is needed to uh, compare the thermal images to uh, the uh, data. So here is just a cartoon uh, from this paper in 2022, um, showing that an uh, area on the surface uh, as the, the asteroid rotate will move across the plane of the image, and therefore we can build a thermal emission here is uh, an animation of the results in, in terms of uh, uh, the electric constant. So uh, by fitting area by uh, area, uh, I get a, a map that has a in terms of reduced chi square uh, below five, which is which we consider acceptable for this type of observation. Um, there are some labeled areas here I'm going to discuss in a second, but I just want to remind that like solid rocks on Earth are, have cold colors and metal oxide and sulfides have the hot colors with the uh, caveat that if you have a very high porosity, uh, metal sulfides could mimic uh, some uh, uh, high dielectric constant rocks. So uh, the first thing that uh, we did was to look if some of the uh, high areas, uh, areas that high, have high metal content on the surface would uh, uh, correlate with uh, uh, depressions on the surface. And the reason being is that those depressions could be areas where uh, like mental material was excavated 
and uh, uh, core materials were exhumated. And uh, also our preferential areas where uh, ferrovulcanic deposits could uh, uh, be preferentially occur, could be preferentially found. So we find actually two areas that uh, uh, match this expectation. However, I want to stress that this is an interpretation. We don't have like uh, uh, laboratory data for the electric uh, uh, constant uh, alma wavelengths. So uh, this uh, will only be uh, like proved or can be proved or, or disproved or confirmed by uh, the uh, Psyche uh, mission. And uh, these areas are statistically, have the electric cost are statistically higher than the uh, average. Um, meaning that we took the, the global standard deviation and looked at what was above and below certain numbers of multiple standard deviation. Regarding the areas that uh, were uh, like statistically, has statistically low uh, dielectric constant, we, find, uh, we found uh, some of those as well. However, um, some of these areas uh, uh, that could resemble uh, uh, silicate from a lost mantle are also uh, in, inside depressions as well. And because the electric constant is not uh, a, a good, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to separate between the different type of silicate rich materials. Another explanation is also possible, and it was observed in the lab, is that uh, asteroids that are silicate rich could have implanted uh, the, uh, silica, a silicate signature on the surface. So these uh, uh, like uh, uh, asteroids implanted the silicates and so what we see is the mixture between uh, uh, silicate and a uh, substrate that is metal rich. So this was seen in the lab um, in which uh, iron ingots uh, uh, and iron meteorites were impacted using uh, projectiles. And uh, um, it was seen that uh, uh, they had a velocity of five kilometers per second, which is more or less the one on the main belt. And uh, uh, a substrate of uh, uh, silicate material was found to be present at the bottom. However, also these are how to scale laboratory experiments from uh, course, the lab space to uh, the asteroids uh, like size is an open question. And therefore also this is a tentative interpretation. So to conclude uh, today, I uh, talked about uh, uh, the uh, in particular, related to the fact that uh, giant impacts could preferentially erode uh, mental uh, materials, therefore, uh, like uh, uh, basically creating uh, remnants that are core uh, of uh, differentiated bodies. Uh, the first uh, results activity that I uh, carried on to uh, test is a potential numerical model, aided by uh, machine learning that allowed it to. Uh, I'll go on like and, uh, let's say uh, overcome the bottleneck uh, uh, due to the large, uh, larger high runtime of uh, uh, plus simulations. And uh, the result is that the mental stripping, uh, uh, so the effort of giant impacts to removing mental materials is more efficient as we go as smaller uh, masses, which makes uh, uh, the then from this, uh, uh, I make the prediction that say that uh, asteroids, among the asteroids, they should be uh, bodies that were differentiated the planetesium and they lost their band. One of these uh, could uh, be asteroid uh, psyche. And the heterogeneous surface uh, in terms of metal content of asteroid psyche is consistent with this giant impact uh, origin. I have to stress that these are interpretation based on ground-based observation for how much high resolution they can be. They cannot uh, like uh, compete with the data that would be returned by the uh, NASA psyche mission. I'm start looking for, for this mission to check this uh, picture. And my current work uh, focuses though on uh, uh, the, uh, in the underst uh, understanding how uh, high uh, metal super Earths form. Because that uh, diagram I showed before in which the uh, metal content increases as a function, uh, uh, it's a, uh, basically it's higher for small uh, bodies, doesn't fit uh, these uh, metal rich super Earths. So uh, understanding how this form is important to understand the uh, diversity of that position. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take the question. Field your own questions, I guess. Huh? You can field, field your own questions. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah, um, on the topic of implantation, um, 
are we, is there a, is there a tight velocity constraint in which that's possible? Like uh, at high velocity um, does everything vaporize and therefore can't really cover the signal. Um, and for that constraint, have you, have you checked that against like what is possible or likely for collisions at Psyche? That's a great question. So in this work that I cited here, Mark I told you, I'm going to invite you to, to read it. It's really like an interesting question. They uh, explore different type of velocities, show, uh, looking, uh, basically finding different level of condition. But also intriguingly, implantation efficiency varies as a function. Remember correctly, like uh, cold uh, projectile, meaning cold below the temperature uh, of ductile transition, show uh, implantation. While uh, uh, the one that like are uh, uh, ambient temperature, they don't uh, like show uh, implantation. So uh, there is uh, like a lot of different uh, direction space to explore. I think this is a type of uh, uh, simulation. Let's say it's it's at the velocity that you would expect from uh, uh, an asteroid impacting psyche in the in the outer main belt. And if I if I may follow up, I guess I'm just still I'm still trying to think about how we can net excavate because we need to make a depression right so we need to excavate material or at least compact so maybe, maybe it's through compaction then but we need to excavate material but still leave a veneer of a silicate um it, it seems tricky yeah but uh, that, that's a that's a great question and uh, i mean I'm, I'm, i know that uh, like it is a team is uh, following up with other words uh particularly related they don't understand like how the uh, intrinsic properties of iron meteorites affect the results over iron ingots and so on for uh, of these, uh, of these uh, like uh, uh, studies, uh, uh, by data, yeah, it's so interesting to see like the structure of the this uh, rim, for example, uh, that uh, that is created. And uh, and the question is also whether this is uh, like limited to the bottom of the depression or will also go to the rims, for example. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yes, please. I have two questions. So one. You showed the plot of probability distribution of metal content per mercury is like way away towards the right. So I'm wondering in the context of what you have presented, could there be a similar thing going on with mercury that could it be the stripped, stripped core of a larger planet where the mantle got removed because of some collision and it's the core that we see as mercury today? Yeah, thank you for, uh, for your question. There are uh, two uh, studies that, uh, uh, actually three studies that uh, Discuss that the, the very first one was in the late 90s, uh, Benz at all, in which uh, uh, they uh, hypothesized that the uh, that mercury was the target of uh, uh, of the collision. However, this has the challenge uh, uh, that uh, mercury could sweep up its own debris, and so uh, this will limit uh, the increase in core mass fraction. Uh, Asfag uh, and Refer 2014 proposed uh, instead that uh, mercury is the project type of the collision, so therefore like the target uh, acts as a natural sink of the uh, mantle. And uh, uh, Chow at all 2018 brought this idea uh, forward, experimenting with uh, uh, chains of collisions, which is also something that we see in our results because you have a lot of five multiple victim runs. And so these are uh, parts of the, uh, uh, like the effort of, let's say, stripping mantles in multiple uh, lower energy collision, which could explain the uh, presence of volatiles on the surface of Mercury. Yeah, thank you for your question. My uh, second question is, for exoplanets that are that are you know, like far away from the solar system, how do you find out observationally what their internal metal content is and like what's the core, what's the mantle? How do you know all that? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, it's uh, indeed uh, like one of the major limitations. So we. The one thing I did that like uh, uh, brought me to uh, focus on asteroids is that we have more data than uh, for exoplanets. So the, the interpretation is mostly based on density. And, uh, and so that it's widely debated actually who, um, which type of interior structure can fit the single point of the density, but also be comprehensive of the large error bars that some of these exoplanets uh, have. Uh, so it's, um, it's still uh, like a field in, uh, in evolution. One thing uh, that uh, it's interesting to know, though, uh, to notice though, is that if you take like the uh, den uncompressed density of uh, uh, this planet and the uncompressed density of Earth, for example, that has a, uh, let's say, core mass fraction more similar to what you expect from 
uh, stellar composition from the sun, these are very are very uh, different. Uh, um, then, like there are papers exploring if they are statistically different, and this reduces the sample to uh, like a, a smaller number of other points, but it's not an, an empty set. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. And I'm um, sure. I guess this is sort of sort of a follow up on on Mercury as well. I think. I mean, I think you mentioned already that there's sort of the nature and nurture question of whether mercury just sort of accreted from metal rich material. And I don't know if you're referring to, obviously there's the very popular idea now in planet formation of pebble accretion, gas rich disc and sort of small things were accreted aerodynamically. And I know there's been at least one paper and I'm forgetting the details of it, uh, led by Anders Johansson, explaining that somehow it was metal rich pebbles that got to mercury uh, and, and that that was a, a possible explanation. So I wonder if you, yeah. I'm sure you're more familiar with that work than I am and wondering your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I read uh, the paper. I thank you for uh, your question. Uh, so yeah, the, if I recall, uh, um, the proposal was that uh, um, iron pebbles, uh, the uh, line of uh, uh, the condensation of the refractory materials uh, in the uh, young sun, uh, around the young sun, and that's location will be preparation for accretion of the metal rich planet azimuth, followed by growth uh, by, by pebble accretion of iron pebbles. Um, however, that model doesn't explain why, despite availability of a large availability of iron uh, uh, pebble population, mercury doesn't run, run away in its growth and become uh, like a metal uh, super. -rich. And the other thing is, is uh, they don't they only focus on uh, uh, on mercury. However, it's also interesting to in, entertain the idea that uh, um, some of these planetesimals could have uh, like be stranded uh, and scattered to the uh, main belt, and maybe could compose some of the population of M-type asteroids today. However, like how the process would happen, and if it would explain like why uh, about fifty percent of uh, asteroid larger than forty kilometers. The outer belt are M-type asteroids, uh, would like uh, at least two point four uh, AU away from their birth, uh, like uh, that remains to be explained. Thank you for your question. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about your neural network architecture. Um, just like you shared that one example of uh, like a single hidden layer, uh, multi-layer perceptron. I'm just wondering, like, is, is that the actual network you're using, or was that just for the sake of example? Yeah, thank you for your question. It was a for the sake of uh, of example. Um, so the the actual architecture of the network uh, is this. Uh, I just is decided through this process of validation. So mm -hmm. trying the different like architectures until uh, like the one that least overfit the data mm -hmm. is found. Like the architecture type is only one of these what are called hyperparameters. Uh, it changes also like with uh, like uh, for example type of neurons, uh, like uh, how much uh, like uh, what is the algorithm that is used. And uh, and if you are interested, I can send you the, the paper. It's up to like a theory of rationale behind, uh, behind that. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Colleen. Um, so since um, Mike Shepard was also on this paper, I was wondering if uh, you compared some of his radar data to, to this and if there were any correlations. Yeah, fantastic question. Uh, so uh, it's actually very intriguing because like uh, we do see some correlations some errors and we don't see. So one thing that uh, it could be possible is that uh, uh, we are probing different depths. So the radar is uh, uh, like probing, let's say the first meter of regolith, uh, while ALMA is uh, sensitive to the first uh, uh, millimeter, let's say one, one centimeter of the uh, regolith. So it could be that like you have certification for which like some errors are covered by uh, silicate rich regolith uh, we're overlying like a metal rich substrate, substrate, which uh, if it's true, like uh, uh, I show only one part of the paper uh, today, the other one was showing a thermal inertia feature uh, indicating uh, possible signs of uh, uh, motion of regolith on the surface. So that would indicate that Psyche is indeed like a, or, uh, I mean, evolved through impacts and like, uh, uh, regolith like uh, was mobile on the surface, it could have explained this signature. Another very interesting thing that we don't see, and I was expected to see, and, and it's something that I'm interested in investigating, it's a correlation between uh, uh, thermal inertia and electric cost, because the metal, uh, like 
it has a higher thermal conductivity than rocks. So it's uh, experienced that rocks are like heat up more quickly. And uh, uh, so it's also thermal inertia is also appropriate for metal content. Therefore, one would expect uh, this correlation. One possible explanation is the uh, effect of grain sizes on the surface, but that needs to be, uh, or other properties that control uh, like thermal inertia, not only thermal conductivity, but also porosity. And uh, uh, this is something that like, uh, it's an open question. Yeah, thank you for uh, your question. I've got questions, but I can ask you later. Oh, uh, please go ahead. I don't know uh, if there are questions. A question about, about we have one last machine question. learning. Yeah, sure. So uh, when, you, when you did your machine learning, did you find that there is a particular parameter, like let's say the impact angle or the velocity, which is most useful in determining the final metallicity? Huh, that's a great question. Um, so the, um, uh, the impact angle uh, is somewhat like uh, by geometric arguments. So you may expect uh, that uh, this was demonstrated back in the 1960s and then uh, like we demonstrated for uh, like uh, uh, bodies that have similar size. Uh, that like uh, uh, the probability distribution is a sign of two theta that peaks at 45 degrees. So if uh, uh, you assume that like most of the collision will uh, occur like uh, say a grazing angles, then it becomes the velocity that like plays a role. Of course, uh, your starting metal composition will also uh, play a role because it may be harder to strip uh, bodies that like it's already metal rich than, than like uh, uh, one that is not metal uh, uh, metal rich. Um, yeah, so that's uh, like uh, something that actually the neural networks uh, are, uh, could really help to do because it's, uh, now it, uh, you can think of populating the entire parameter space, uh, a very high density of uh, simulation, something that would take like uh, uh, hundreds of years of CPU time, and then uh, like look for clustering and look for trends that they can inform you about the physics. And uh, so, yeah, thank you for, uh, for your If you're interested in such a project, please reach out. <laughs> With me, something would be thriller to have to. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was just interested because you, for the first part, you talked about your model, and for the second part, you talked about psyche. But when you were talking about the model, what you showed the um, mass of the objects for like Earth to, to Mars or Luna sized, where psyche is quite a bit smaller. The model on the um, size scale of psyche. Um, yeah. yeah, fantastic question. Is actually part of, part of my current work. Uh, so we have this new da data set that was produced by Tanan that uh, um, ranges between uh, uh, masses that are approximately the size of Psyche up to super Earths. Uh, and there also varies the core mass fraction between uh, uh, rock, rock, rocky bodies to uh, fully metallic. But that's actually uh, one thing that uh, I'm moving to uh, right now is. Uh, to uh, how to form the like psyche. And the, the, the problem is that the solution is uh, because like you can have a lot of different, uh, yeah, the same like outcome from different uh, starting points. And also if you factor in the possibility of collision chains that increases also like the degeneracy as well. Uh, so yeah, um, as I mentioned that like uh, is an intuition that the trend would continue and explain the diversity of large asteroids. However, that's something that like one, uh, uh, would uh, look uh, we need to look into it thank you very much yeah, okay last 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 question. Uh, just uh, about the your neural network and the when you compare the output that you get to the test case uh, is the misfit function a, a flat line or do you have some collisions that you are that are more difficult to explain uh, yeah that's the question um, yes, there are some collisions that they are like harder to uh, So the, the idea is that uh, what we found it was my paper in 2019 is that uh, at the uh, boundaries uh, between uh, like uh, physical uh, regimes, uh, where where like for instance you go from uh, accretion to erosion, that's where like the uh, mis the, the prediction of the neural networks gets. A bit more uh, like uh, uh, a bit more inaccurate, and the reason why is because like the physics is changing, 
but also the prediction of the SPH are much more sensitive to the parameters and these are like confounds like the, uh, the network. Uh, so we, we do provide like maps of the mean square error as a function of impact uh, properties and the impact conditions. And indeed, the showing that uh, uh, where like the, the, this boundary and how we know these boundaries is because in this paper, in that paper, we also run a classifier. So we actually did the, like this the fun activity that we gathered one night and looked at these simulations and voting, say, oh, this is erosion and this is uh, like uh, accretion. And based on those votes, uh, average among like a group of people, we trained this uh, support vector machine which is another algorithm able to uh, make a categorical prediction. So from that, we know the boundaries of the different regimes and exactly on those boundaries, there are these fancy areas that uh, have a higher uh, like uncertainty. So yeah, that's actually understanding uh, what really drives that the confusion, let's say, uh, between uh, these, uh, this, the, 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 you know, the prediction and that's, that's another interesting question I didn't follow up with that yet. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming back to LPL. Give us a fantastic.